Knowledge is the power to overcome everything. Nothing happens without reason and purpose. Where you allow your consciousness to go, your health and life will follow. We have been taught the hardcore fact is that physical things cause physical problems and need a physical cure. And it's not true. Biography becomes biology. Yeah, our biography, what happens in our life becomes our biology because everything in your body has been a part of your life. It's a reflection of your life. When you're born, your body is literally your soul consciousness made physical. So everything you experience in life becomes an addendum of change to the physical body, to health, for good or ill. If good things happen, you feel elated. If bad things happen, you, you feel like your knees are rubber and you have to sit down. This is the, the effect of purposeful communication from spirit through health, telling you what you got to go fix, what you have to change your mind on, what you have to do differently to make spontaneous remission happen. But it's not so spontaneous if you've worked hard at it for weeks or months. So, so I'm telling you that, that healing with purpose is a thing. Welcome back insightful souls to unleash thyself. I'm Constantine Moron, and if part one of the conversation with Dr. Richard Leach left you wanting more, today's discussion promises to quench the thirst. If you haven't seen part one of our conversation, I would highly recommend you go back and give it a listen. In today's episode, we journey further into the heart of karmic DNA and biosymbiology unraveling its profound revelations. The secrets of your very existence, the stress you bear, and the symptoms your body exhibits all echo a deeper truth. Together with Richard, we explore the intricate dance of light and shadow that defines our existence and the remarkable concept of karmic DNA. Each of us is a unique blend of cosmic energies. But how do these energies shape up our reality? And how can we harness them for holistic well-being? Among many things, Karmic DNA promises to help you understand your soul's purpose, your gifts and challenges, and how stressors will show up in your life. With plenty of examples from Richard's practice and a look at my own Karmic DNA, we'll get to uncover many of its secrets. We'll also dive deeper into the mechanics of healing with purpose, biosymbiology and epigenetics, the groundbreaking study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. But before we jump in, if this podcast has been expanding your horizons, do us a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to Unleash Thyself and leave us a review or comment. Your support is our fuel and it helps us continue to bring you game-changing content week after week. Grab your journal, make a note of your reflections, and immerse yourself in this exploration of self. Let's get started. Let's dig a little deeper into these things because, I mean, I've given the overview of the fact that everything has purpose. Yes. And finding the purpose is the path to solving illness. And I talked a little bit about the foundation of spiritual purpose in humanity, the reason humanity is here. We covered that. We didn't get too far into talking about what karmic DNA is all about, but I can tell you that like I was talking about your karmic DNA as an example, and basically bing, bing, bing. I mean, it's all there and it's, you see, you feel the truth. And this was done with mathematics, right? So, you know, anybody could go to my website, uh, karmicdna.com, and there's a chart on the first page where you put your name and your birthday and your email, and it will bring up your chart, a sampler of what's in your, you, you see the whole chart, but it'll talk two more pages that gives a little brief explanation about the top three influences. And I mean, believe me, that's mild compared to what I can tell. I could talk about you. Constantine, I could talk about your karmic day, your life purpose, and all of its tools, all of its gifts, all of its challenges. I could talk about you for over two hours and not be redundant. So this little write-up is just a sample of a hint of what those top three influences are and what they are. So it doesn't really, it's, it, I mean, it's not meant to teach people how to be. That they come to me for, you know, that we delve into in weekly sessions because there's too much. You know, I tell people stuff and they can't remember it week to week. 
So we have a little bit of repetition to, to really teach them about themselves. Right. And, but the biggest powerful thing is it shows me all of the things that will stress you specifically, you, no one else, all of the kinds of things that stress you in your life. And then we have the purpose of health, right. As a, as a spiritual guidance, right. And so this is impacting the health. As I said earlier, stress is not just exacerbating illness. It is causing illness. I don't care who you are or what you got. It caused, it was caused by stress and figuring out which stress it is very important to your cure. And so when we're talking about biosymbology, I tell you, biosymbology is, is written in such a way as that there's a, a medical write-up and then there's a biosymbology write-up on the same page. If it's talking about, if it's talking about the heart, it talks about what medicine knows about the heart, how it functions, why it does this and that and the other thing. And then it biosymbology talks about the meaning of what the heart's doing and how it's doing it and why it's doing it. And you can actually, if you read them both one after the other, you can actually look at it and go, oh, this is amazing. This is tied right into medical science. Biosymbology. It's not just, you know, oh, this means that and that means this. And it's this is showing you for real that this is what you this is what the heart means. And when it's not working properly, this is what it means. This is, you know, and that you start going, okay, well, that, what kind of stress would that be? Okay. And I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example, kind of an example that I had a woman whose telephone said healing hands on my tall display, but she never said nothing about herself. She said, I want to bring my father to you. He's just had quadruple bypass heart surgery and uh, a month ago. And all of a sudden now, He's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I said, really? And I want to bring him to you to see if you can help him. And I said, okay. I said, my first session is three hours. I know I have to build rapport. I have to get attention. I have to get them believing. You can't do that in an hour, right? So I know three hours. She's, well, he won't sit for three hours. I said, oh, well, we could always sit in my living room because I my office is my house. I, we can sit in my living room so he's more comfortable. Oh, no, he won't do that. She wouldn't tell me nothing about him. She wouldn't tell me nothing about herself. Just I want to. So she made the appointment. I said, well, we'll do as much as we can, you know. So the first thing that happens, they come in. I'm with a, I'm finishing an energy treatment on the table. And they come in. They sit in the foyer. And there's a clipboard with a red pen out there where they're going to fill out the incoming forms. There's four forms. And they fill out the, in, the incoming forms. And he refuses to fill the last two out. One is a stress inventory and one is a depression inventory. I'm not here for stress and I'm not depressed. So the person leaves, I come out and he refuses. So I said, well, look, can you just do it? Humor me because everybody does it. It just gives me a little insight. So what does he do? He puts zero, zero, zero. It's all by numbers. One, zero, one, two, three, four, five. You circle, right? For each statement, right? Zero, 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 zero. The whole column down. He says, there, I did it. It wasn't real. Meanwhile, while he's doing that, I go in the office and I do his karmic DNA and I'm going, whoa. I got General George Patton here. Life at my demand. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself, hard hearted. No wonder heart surgery. He's as bitter as a lemon. And so he comes in, he sits down and I'm talking to him and I'm being very careful because he's a very analytical guy. I can see his karmic DNA. You know, he's, he's going to be skeptical. So instead of going to the spiritual stuff, I go to the scientific research, the research done at Harvard, the research done at UCLA that backs up what I'm talking about and how I'm talking. And, and I, I laid a good groundwork and I'm feeling good about myself. And I figure, you know, I got him. He's following. And then I switch and I start telling him about his karmic DNA. Of course, I'm sitting there with the chart on the screen. I'm telling him about his karmic DNA. He gets in his, his head that his daughter has told me about him, you know, behind his back. And I'm dressing him down. And all I'm doing is telling him about his karmic DNA, his challenges. I want to plug in. I want him to see that this is real. No, he thinks it's bogus. He thinks it's all contrived. She set it up. He gets angry. One hour, he says, I haven't heard a damn thing that could help me. So I'm leaving. I said, we barely started. He said, doesn't matter. I said, can I ask you a question? Why would you come if you're just going to leave? And he said, my daughter, is a registered massage therapist. 
and she thought you could help me. And obviously she's wrong. Meanwhile, I'm thinking to myself, I've figured out because a mutual client that this lady might be a registered massage therapist, but that's not what she's doing. She's doing cranial sacral therapy and past life regression while she does it. She can't even come out of the closet and tell her own father what she's doing. That's why she's got to come to me. And she gets in a huff and says, how much do I owe you? And I said, nothing. You know, we didn't do anything. There's only a 13% survival rate for pancreatic cancer. And I'm going to tell you what happened. They did a surgery on the heart to take away the system's ability to communicate to him about his heart heartedness and cause the purpose of it had to go somewhere. And it went to the pancreas. They wouldn't have missed pancreatic cancer in the heart workup. Seriously. That's intense scrutiny. It wasn't there before the heart operation. But 30 days later, pancreatic cancer, it was manifest total. So it's like you see these things, you see the purpose and the reason. Like that's why people, as they get older, they end up taking this cocktail of, of a gazillion pills. Why? Because they to go to the doctor with one thing, they start like when they're 50 or something, they go to the doctor with one thing and they give him a prescription. And a little while later, they go to the doctor is another thing. Well, it moved. It couldn't talk to him now. They fixed it with the prescription. So it moved and it's now talking to him this way. By the time it goes around to different places, they got this cocktail of God knows how many different things that they, they're, they're, they're having to, to medicate, right? And then some of them are conflicting and, and they haven't got to the source. Not once have they asked why. Why is this happening? And by the time it gets to me, it's like so far removed from the original. I, I got to backtrack and say, when did this all start? What was the first thing that happened to you? What was the second thing that happened to you? What, and the symptoms teach me how the body responded to continue communicating its purpose. And that's how I find the purpose. Hey, it's Constantine here. And I want to take a brief moment to truly thank you for being a part of this incredible journey of transformation. You are the reason we are creating this content. I see you and I appreciate you. Your support truly means the world to me. I want to ask you for a small favor. I'd love for you to join our mission by hitting like, subscribe, or leaving a thoughtful comment or review. Your engagement helps others discover these insights and together we can continue to unlock the power of authenticity and personal transformation. And if you want to reach out directly to me, send me an email at constantine at unleashedthyself.com. I value any and all feedback. Thank you for being a part of this movement. Now, back to the episode. And so here's the key, the magic, what would they call it? The, the secret sauce, right? The secret sauce remedy to what I do. It's something I learned in Power Squadron as a teenager in nautical navigation. You get a buoy and a point and a lighthouse, and you get a fix on all three of those things, and you can find where you are in that nebulous of the lake. I know I did it. I took a seven horse motor on a runabout, and I went all around Lake Simcoe, and I got to, to Beaverton without looking up, just by the compass and the chart. I got to Beaverton Harbor within 40 feet. That's how I find illness. Karmic DNA is one fix. What kind of stress this man has? Biosymbology. What is the body screaming it about? And now you tell me your stress history, what's been going on with you. And that's how we zero in on the real cause of any disorder. A deal. I mean, that's how I've had so much success over a quarter century. It, it's not easy. It doesn't go fast. It takes a lot of talking because the client doesn't even know what I'm looking for. And I, why would I, how can I explain you know, I'm, I ask questions, they talk, we talk about their history, I make notes, we, you know, and slowly I learn all of the pieces of the puzzle to figure out why this is there, why this is, why is illness visiting their life? Because visiting is exactly what it's doing. It's not permanent. So, so yeah. that's the biosymbiology part, life symbolic, life science. I spent 20 years writing volume one. I'm halfway through volume two and three. Volume one is the entire anatomy and it's geared to medical science. And uh, volume two is all known symptoms and volume three is all known diseases. So it's a life work I'm working on. But basically there is enough already in knowing the entire anatomy and where to go looking for the kind of things we're looking for. There's enough there to function. 
And all those pieces had to be in place before I created the course to teach practitioners. I had to give them the solid foundation they needed to do the work. And so, so that's how our life becomes our health. Our biography becomes our biology. Now, a lot of people, especially, by the way, I've had medical doctors, a psychiatrist, nurses, all kinds of healthcare workers as clients. I'm coming to you in private, but you're not to tell anybody I was here. So, so, but the thing is that a lot of people from a conventional point of view, because let's face it, we have been weaned. We have been taught. The hardcore fact is that physical things cause physical problems and need a physical cure. And it's not true, right? I, I had this wonderful conversation with, with an MD, a doctor, and he was, he and I were locking horns pretty good early in the conversation. You know, I'm trying to share how it is and he's like rebutting everything. And all of a sudden he sits back and he looks over his glasses and he says, you know, you might have something here because we will track this stuff in the stomach over here to here. We'll track it all the way right back to brain chemistry out of balance. But nobody dare ask the next question because we can't go smaller. Why is this brain chemistry out of balance? And it could be thought. Thought could be making brain chemistry out of balance, causing a chain reaction through the body till you finally get the end result and symptom. So as I said, there's lots of people who would be skeptical until they really digest the big picture. But I've been pioneering the purpose of health and healing with purpose for over 25 years, long before I ever heard of epigenetics. And of course, lots of people have heard of epigenetics now. Parallel, parallel to my work in the 90s, okay, Dr. Bruce Lipton, a cellular biologist, medical doctor, and teacher at medical college, okay, had been working in cellular biology since the 60s. And he had come up with a body of evidence that he finally released in a white paper in the early 90s to colleagues, to the medical establishment for which he was shunned because it contradicted almost everything they believe about genetics. He found in his work since the 60s that we have like, I don't know, I don't know, 78 billion cells in our body, or maybe it's 48 billion, doesn't matter, vast amount. We've got all these cells in our body and each and every cell has a membrane around it made of the same material as the gray matter as our brain. Every cell in the body thinks doesn't have a mouth, can't talk back. It can only vibrate out of balance to cause a symptom. So he found that cells are intelligent. And by the time he coined epigenetics, and I'll tell you what it means, epi means over and genetics means control. For over a hundred years, we believed that genetics was a plan. And if it's in the plan, you're screwed. It's going to happen. It's not true. The genetic plan is like the blueprints for a house. Better still, it's like the script of a movie of your life. And it has all the variables. It's like duct tape. It's got a dark side and a light side. It's all the planning you need for this structure to do whatever it's going to do for the rest of your life. But it doesn't implement it. He found that the cells yeah. thinking and how he found this was he took cells from uh, stem cells, right? And he took it from the same cluster. He put stem cells in three different Petri dishes and put them in three different environments. And depending on the environment that the cells were in, one cell structure made bone. Same stem cells as the other ones. The next one made muscle and one made fat. All the same stem cells making different things. What was the variable? The environment the stem cells were in. Stem, stem cells, the, the cells of the body react to the environment they're in. Now, if their consciousness, they have a brain, if their consciousness, they're listening to what? Everything you think Everything you feel, everything you say, everything you do, everything. They're listening to your life. And if you're upset by God, they're upset too. They're team players. You know, if you're upset about something, if you're thinking negatively, upset, they're right on that track like, a, like white on rice. And what do they do? The cells are the cast and the crew to make the movie of your life, of your health. So the cells being the cast and the crew, go read the script. They get the word from headquarters, what you're thinking, and they go read the script. And the script in the genetic code, they read either the dark side or the light side, depending on how bad you're thinking. And they come back and they implement 
often the dark side because we are negative dominated creatures. Why are we negative dominated creatures? Because it's our job. It's why negativity is so high in the newspaper. It's our job. We're attracted to it like moths to a lamp. We've got to re oh, look at that. What's happening there? You know, like, you know, we're fixated on negativity. So we're negative dominated. We're doing a lot of negative thinking. Is it any wonder we're a chronically ill society? Seriously, folks, this is the reason we are so sick today because we think dark, we think upsets, we think in fear, we think in worry. And all that does is tell the cell, go get the dark side and implement the dark side. And that's where illness comes from. That's the mechanics under healing with purpose. That's the mechanics of how biography becomes biology. Yeah, our biography, what happens in our life becomes our biology. And this is the mechanics of it. Proven in science. Because it's not just Bruce Lipton that proved it. Now, several other researchers have gone over his work and repeated his research and said, yeah, that's what happens. This is true. This is the mechanics of, of yeah. illness. And so I said I was pioneering healing with purpose back in the 90s. I didn't even hear about epigenetics till after I heard about the secret. When I heard about the secret, I was like, oh, this is wonderful. I can, instead of spending three sessions explaining things to people, I can say, just go watch the secret movie and come back and we'll talk, you know? <laughs> so, so it was like I, to, to give them a leg up to understanding me, you know? And so then later, it was late in, I, I think it was maybe 2010 or 29 when I started hearing about epigenetics. And I found out that, hey, this is the science They've built a whole bloody science underneath all my work. You know, like, how, how happy was I? Now science has is is built a foundation under everything I've been doing and how it works and why. It, they built the why. I know it works. I, I've seen it, done it, been there. But they built the why, you know. So this was, a, this was wonderful for science to, to come up underneath my work and prove that what I'm doing is valid and functional and, eff and efficient. I've even had a nurse. I had a nurse that came to me and That's she wrote a testimonial. It's on my website. She wrote, she was a nurse, an ER nurse that had been like 15, 18 years in the biz. And she went back to school and got her doctorate. And she ended up, she's retired now, but she ended up a director of medicine at uh, Brantford General Hospital. Okay. So her testimony challenged the medical establishment to look into what he's doing. Because she had knee problem for 10 more years. And I relieved it in like three months. And she was wowed because she had, she'd seen bad surgery in the knees go bad. And she didn't want that. She, the drugs didn't work. But I worked. Because I found the reason it was there. And we solved the puzzle. And it went away. It no longer had a spiritual right to be present. So, so we're talking about all of this. This is the mechanical foundation of science underneath what I've been talking about, the overview of my work, all this session with you. And so it's fascinating to realize because what, what I left out was, you know, you got the cells who are the cast and the crew are going to implement the movie of your life, right? Of your health, right? And you got the script, the genetic plan. What's missing? The director of the movie. The Who's point. the director of your movie? Yeah. Are you directing like Alfred Hitchcock or are you directing like Steven Spielberg? Is this fun and whimsy or is this a horror? And what result in your health is going to be there depending on the director? And you're him. You're the director. You direct your life. You get what you get because you made the decisions. I love the analogy you use because it's so visual. It's so easy to see it. Because the director gets the crew yep. and the actor do whatever he wants based on the script. And yeah, we are the director. So beautiful. I love it. Absolutely. And that's the backbone of our health. It's the backbone of healing with purpose. And so it's fascinating to see this unfold like this, you know, and all the different pieces of the puzzle. I, I said to you earlier, I don't know whether it was today or another time, but I said to you, it's really hard to share what I do in a brief way because there's so many moving parts. There's so many complex different pieces of the puzzle and they all fit together, right? And if you don't tell most of the pieces, people are sitting there going, I don't think so. I don't get that. I don't, you know, that doesn't sound, that sounds far-fetched to me, you know, and in actual it fact. It took me a while to wrap my head around it. And I've known about this for a while. And I thought, 
Carmi DNA was just a piece. And then I realized, like you said, that it's one of multiple pieces that have to fit together to truly get to the purpose of solution. Yeah. For what to I- either resolve issues in your health or avoid issues in your health or find the path of ease to your life to be happy and successful. Because no matter what you do, if you're not doing the spiritual challenges right, you're not going to get the successful. You're just not rewarded. You know, it's why one person achieved something and you did the same thing and you, you, you go, what's wrong with me? Well, you had these challenges. He didn't have those challenges. He zoomed ahead. You know, he got to leave out step three and six and you saw him and you left out step three and six and yours folded like a broken machine, right? It was like, so, so, so these things, I mean, everything is purpose and reason. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense why different tools or so let's say the same tools that work for me won't work for you. Because you operate with different challenges and different tools, essentially. Exactly. And it explains like why people try to sell this idea of like, use these five tools and you're going to become a millionaire and then it works for a small percentage and no one else. Yeah, the, it works for the percentage of people who have karmic DNA that are similar. But it's funny because you you hit a nail right here on the head because everybody has a different objective in life right? Everybody has a different purpose and a different challenge, series of challenges. And so, so people think they've got it figured and they write self-help books and other people go around buying all kinds of self-help books and reading them and going, it didn't work for me. Why? Because it worked for people who had those kinds of challenges, not for you with their kind of challenges, you know? So it's, I, I, and, and this was cool because when I taught my practitioner's course, When I taught karmic DNA, I said to the group, I said, you never going to know the power of counsel with karmic DNA until you yourself are sitting across from someone counseling them to do something that you yourself would never in a million years do. But you're counseling it because you see it in their karmic DNA, not because it's what you think should be done. It's not because you did it and got got it right. No, you're seeing their challenges and you're saying, you're going to need to do this and this to get this on, on track. And you know that you wouldn't do it yourself. That's powerful because all other therapies are boilerplate. They go, they learn this X, Y, Z answer to these problems and they go forth and they want to tell everybody, do this, do this, do this, do this. Well, I don't know why it's not working for you, but this is custom. Counseling with karmic DNA is custom to the individual, to their life, to their needs, to their spiritual challenges. And that's why it works consistently year after year, day after day. Powerful stuff. And you gave an example of when it didn't work, when the other person on the other side is not open, when they have, right? When (laughs) they don't give themselves time to process the information and see with and see if it makes sense at the cellular level on the inside. Am I right in, in saying that? Absolutely. And that's why it takes long. You know, you feed somebody information at the pace they can accept it. They need to digest it before next week. And sometimes you have to go back and, and talk again about it. But you feed them at their pace, not the pace I'm dumping on you today. <laughs> you know, it's like you feed them what they can take. And it takes more weeks, but it's more efficient because you don't want to push them to the point where they go, oh, I don't, I can't believe that anymore. I'm not going back. Right. And you try not to do that. But I can tell you one time I had this guy, I met him at the health show. He came to the office and he sat in the chair and I'm telling him about his karmic DNA and I'm telling him in depth about his karmic DNA. Right. And as I said, I can talk two hours about karmic DNA and not be redundant. And on, on a given person. And so here we was that he, I finished, I think it took two sessions to, to talk about his karmic DNA and which is like three hours. So, or more. And so at the end he sits back and he says, you know, I hear all of this, but you know, all of these things I'm thinking, yeah, it's me. It works me. It's that's true. And this is true. But you know what? You could tell this to a hundred different people. They all think they'd sit there and nod and go, yeah, that's true for me. That's true for me. That's true for me. I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'm going to now tell you about a karmic DNA code that you don't own. How's that? And you tell me that it's for you, right? You just tell me that when I tell you about this, you tell me that it fits you in somehow kind of way because you don't have it. You don't own it. It's not in your, it's not embedded in your electromagnetic structure. It ain't there. 
I told him about the code of transformation he didn't have. And I didn't even get finished. He sits back and he says, no, that's not me. <laughs> I said, that's the proof. I'm not telling you stuff that's just random. I'm telling it because karmic DNA, the mathematics says you got it. And it's never wrong. Here's not the ever. funny part, Richard. The, the audience doesn't necessarily know this story, but when I was about, what, 25, 26 is when I stumbled upon this knot by choice. It's through the family and looking to find a way to help my ex-wife and my brother. They were going through some tough times. And we met one of your colleagues and we went to have the sessions. And I remember going there. I was one of the first and she had my name and she had uh, the date of birth. And I could not wrap my head around how she knew so much about me that I was even refusing to acknowledge. Like I knew those parts were there, but I was like, nah, this is not something I want to accept. To the point, like your other <laughs> clients, I was like, oh, my mom must have talked to her. Alexandra must have told her about this. But there were things none of them knew. Yeah. And I knew. And, you know, it talked about my relationship with my ex-wife, Alexandra, and with my mother and with my brother. And it goes very deep. And, of course, I was like, what, 25, whatever, mid-20s. I didn't do much with that, right? Even for me, it was overwhelming. And I didn't have the resources around me, maybe the, the people to talk to this about. And I kind of left it in the back pocket. But guess what? It, it never really goes away. You know, like... Seven, eight years later, I was like, I remember this. I'm like, you know what? I want to dig deeper. And the rest is history because that's really what started yeah. me on this path of trying to understand from not necessarily a mathematical and computer science background, which is what I have, to more of like, okay, I feel inside that there's more to life than I understand and we can understand right now. Let me find out why. Is that calling that many of yeah. us have, but we don't necessarily jump on. And, and the key is this. I mean... Based in ancient scripture, this is contemporary and still functioning today. And it is the path to unleash yourself. That's what you're searching for. This is the cornerstone yeah. for each and every human on the world. You know, I mean, I had one person, conventional pr practitioner, uh, arguing for Myers-Briggs. Have you ever heard of Myers-Briggs test? And, and, and with the Myers-Briggs, you fill out all these questions and then they analyze your answers, you know, and they come out. There are four archetypes in Myers-Briggs and 16 possible combinations to define the complexity of you being human. This is like Myers-Briggs on steroids. This is 10 different codes, potentially, not four. It is 10 different code positions in your chart that can com combine to make the complexity of being human for you specifically in depth. So the variables are astronomical. Never mind 16 combinations. You got 10 possible combinations here out of, you've got six codes in the 10 spots and all at varying depths of degree. You know, it's like you have 150 originality or 120 reflection, 120 insight, 80 illumination, 60 power, and 10 optimism. So that's a wobbly wheel. Karmic DNA is soul consciousness divided up into 10 equal parts, and nobody comes with the 10 equal parts. Soul consciousness is perfection, all balanced at 100%. You pack an overnight bag of karmic DNA to come into this incarnation, and you exaggerated three of your codes, a caricature, more than 100%. And then you filtered out three other codes to less than they are. So you're a wobbly wheel. You're literally imperfectly balanced, right? That's what causes your individual life agenda path. And then, you know what? I can tell you this without a shadow of doubt. It would take 65,686 years before another human could be on this planet exactly duplicate of you. And that's so a long time. <laughs> none yeah. of us can compare each other. We all have similarities, yes, but we can't compare. You can't think, oh, he's better than me because on that subject he may be, but on this subject I'm better than him because that's the way I'm built. I'm built with these tools, these gifts, these talents, and each of these gifts and talents has challenges forcing me to confront bringing the challenge out in a positive way. It's my boot camp to become the best expression of me possible. So it's fascinating. That's the complexity of being human. That's what. That's how this measures up in science. There's no comparison because you don't have to do all that testing and answering questions. 
I can do the karmic DNA in, in, in two minutes, two minutes. I could do it up by hand. It's fast and it's always accurate. There's no doubt. It's never been wrong. And it gives me the back door into what's going on with the person. What do they need to do be, to be happy, to be successful, to be in love. I've had clients call me up from restaurant bathrooms and say, here's his birthday. What have I got? <laughs> They're on a date. <laughs> you know, is this compatible? And I will say, yeah, it's not so bad. I mean, there's complexity to compatibility, but I say it's not so bad, but, but watch this and this and this. If he does these things in a, in a bad way, this is not going to be good because there's a dark side and a light side to your karmic DNA. There's a wonderful side of every code that's very, very forward positive, but there's a dark side to every code too. Optimism is the artist, author, performer that wants to uplift and inspire people. If it goes dark, it becomes the pessimism code. And you've met those people, you know, like it, they're living in the dark space yeah. of their masterful communicative ways. They're not uplifting anything. They're really putting asunder. So is, let me ask this, because this keeps coming to mind. Is the goal then to be only on the light side or to bring it all in balance? Where you understand the dark, you spend time there to get yourself attuned to it and, and learn the challenges and then you get to a balanced state. If I was talking about a pure goal, the goal is to know this so well is that you always make the right choice. You don't need to walk in the dark side. You don't need to swim in the muddy water. You, you don't need bad experiences. I had one woman argue with me. If I didn't do the, 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 the dark stuff, I wouldn't know how good the light stuff was. I said, okay, if you, if, that's called free will. I mean, this environment, spirit put this environment together for us to have pure potential. Give, you know, people blame God. How could God make this happen? How could God allow this to happen? This is horrible. Well, you know what? Thank God that God created the environment that gave you the choice to do that dark road or not. You know, you, he gave you pure potential. What have you done with it? You know, so, so, and I shouldn't say he, because I know that God wouldn't be gendered, right? There's no gender on the other side. So, I mean, if anything, we have reason to know that low vibration is masculine and high vibration is feminine. The first three chakras in the body are, are masculine. The heart is neutral and the top three chakras are feminine. So the higher the vibration goes, the more likely it is God is female. So, but we're talking about this. What's the goal? The goal is to master your challenges so that you can have a wonderful life. The life you deserve. We all deserve a, a, a wonderful life, right? We don't deserve... To, to go through the gauntlet of horrible experiences that we do, we're making our mistakes in going there, right? But our mistakes are supposed to, going there is supposed to teach you to not go there again, <laughs> you know? It's literally about learning enough about what's on the dark side that you always are choosing the positive on the light side and avoiding the dark side. And, and in some respect, you're right, because if you don't go and do the dark side, how are you going to know to make the, the challenge? To, to make the right decisions. But that's where I came in, right? I mean, for thousands of years, we've been doing this the hard way. You know, autopilot, trial and error. Oh my God, that was horrible. I don't want to do that again. I had to do it to find out how bad it was. And I won't do that again. Why? Why do you have to do that? If I can give you the knowledge of all of the challenges and you could recognize them as they unfold on your horizon, you go, oh, I know what that is. That's that challenge there. I know what to do with that. There's my answer. That's, I never thought of it that way. That's really interesting, Richard. So let me ask you this, because you mentioned a couple of challenges for me. Well, a few more, actually. Let's take the trust one. How, can, how is it a challenge, first of all? And second of all, how could one, let's say, that has a trust challenge in their karmic DNA, come to be able to notice it far enough so you don't have to spend time in the dark side? Because that's what I'm still trying to wrap my head around, and I would imagine many others will have you, the same question. You picked a good one. All of the challenges are there to hone your skills with the gifts and tools that you brought with you. This trust challenge comes with reflection. Reflection is a quiet watcher. It's an introvert. It's the quiet side. You'd rather be watching the, the goings on than be the center of attention. Yeah, you're nodding. And so the thing is that reflection is, is literally the philosopher, the deep thinker, the problem solver for all humanity. So let's say, I'm going to tell you all about reflection. I mean, this is the truth of the whole thing, okay? And 
is this is condensed and to the point and conceptual. So while I would teach you it differently in session, this is the conception the, uh, of it. So the philosopher, the problem solver is here to guide humanity with what humanity cannot see because it has a specific gift to see deeply and quickly into anything. You know that you see things and you talk to your friend and your friend goes, yeah, you saw that? I didn't see that. Where were you? We just watched the same thing. What's wrong with you? You collect information like osmosis through the skin, right? All the data all at once. What does a philosopher need to figure out what's going on? Needs all the data very fast all at once. What does a problem solver need? All the data very fast all at once. It's a gift. So you collect more raw data as you go through life than everybody else who doesn't have this. Okay. So, so let's say on an average day, your eyes are open most of the time and you're collecting raw data. By the time the day is over, you're, there's times you can't go to sleep at night. Yeah, for sure. Why? Why? Because all that raw data is rolling around. You haven't done nothing with it. You have to do something with the data. So not only do you collect the data, you got to reflect on the data, the reflection code. Yes. You got to reflect on the data you got today and figure out what it all means. And you literally sift through the stuff and you say, well, the, the stuff that John was talking about, that's kind of important. I'm going to put that over in this box. And the stuff that Susan said, well, she was being devil's advocate, that's garbage, put that in the trash. And you go, you sift through your day figuring out what's important, what isn't important, and then you connect the dots with the things you got yesterday and the day before and then last week. You're slowly building a body of evidence to solution, right? This is how your gift works, that you're gathering information and you're building towards a solution for all humanity. And so, but while you're doing your reflection, guess what? You see red flags, oh yeah. You're going along doing your reflection, going, wait a minute. Why do you say that? Why is he doing that? What's going on there? That was kind of shady. Who's that? This code is a worry code. It gets all this data. It doesn't want to do with it. It's like worry, 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 keeps you awake. And so, so basically, you got to do the reflection to, to figure things out and put things to bed before you can sleep. I often recommend a hot bath in a dark room because it gets you away from the telephone and other people talking. So, so you literally, you know, you, you put a candle in the bathroom, get a nice hot bath, kick back and think about the day, reflect on your day, reflect on your stuff and organize your thoughts and put them in compartments. But if you've done that, you get to go to sleep. Okay. So that's the chaos of the mind that comes with reflection, right? Now, the next thing, as I said, is the stability of the red flags, right? You get these red flags and you're going, oh, what's going on there? It makes you worry. And, and what do you do with those red flags? Like literally, you, I'm going to tell you, you got 120 reflection. I'll guarantee you, and you don't have to say nothing, that you have more betrayal in your past than anybody else you know. Trust and betrayal, right? Why? Guess what? For every betrayal you ever had, you had data long before the betrayal. You had the red flags. And you know what you did with the red flags? You didn't want to believe it. You took the red flags and stuck them under the carpet in the dark where they can fester. Because I don't want to believe that Dan would do that to me. I don't want to believe that Donna would betray me. Whatever, whoever. I mean, I'm just pulling names out of the air. But the idea is that you bury the information. This is a God-given tool. And you know, you dishonored it. You threw the data away. Didn't want to believe it. It's your data. You're the problem solver. You're the one that's supposed to do something with it. Why not? Well, you have a challenge with openness. You know, I, I sometimes tell people with reflection this story and they, they end up saying, you know, I felt like you stripped all my clothes off and made me naked. And so, so I'm saying to you and for all the world to hear that you have a challenge with openness. And it's not a bad challenge. You're not holding things in maliciously. You know, I'll tell you what it is, is that, is that you don't think you're ready for prime time. See, it's funny you mentioned that. Oh my God, it's so funny you mentioned that because... Yes, that was a huge challenge for me. And I'm sure it still is to some degree. But that's one thing I've changed in the last few months. Being more vulnerable, being more open about my experiences. But still, it's still there. Yeah. I don't care how open you think you are. There's things inside you that you will not share. 
But exactly. maybe once you understand that the challenges are purposeful, that the challenge of openness Every challenge is a power tool for excavating your abundance in life. And when you're not mastering the challenge, you're not getting it. You're not getting abundance. So openness is your challenge. Constantine, repeat after me these words. Okay. Openness. Openness. Is my friend. Is my friend. Again, openness is my friend. Openness is my friend. I'm going to tell you this this way because... You have it backwards. All reflection people do. They feel that holding things back gives them wiggle room. Holding things back. They don't actually say what's in their head and mind right now. They, have, they can maybe change their mind next week. Because, you know, more information, more data will come and they might change their mind. And so they don't think they're ready for prime time. They don't think they're ready to tell. So they hold it in. Masters at holding stuff in and worrying their guts out. Ulcers galore. So, so here we go. Openness is my friend. Why is it my friend? Because everybody around you is doing stuff and a lot of it you don't like. It's not what you would want, but they're doing it because they just thought that's the, the thing to do. If you were open about the truth and the knowledge that you had, do you think they'd still do those things? Well, some may. You would be protected. If you told people the truth about this and that and the other thing, it would affect how they make the decisions and they wouldn't do the things that you'd hate the most. Openness is my friend. So openness is a challenge to the philosopher, the problem solver for all humanity. Why? Because what good are you if you're not going to tell what you know? Who, who are you advancing? Who are you helping with solutions you don't share? Even if you think the solution is half-baked, it's helpful. You see the guy across the street and he's struggling with something. You're looking over there. You're going, I know I, what I know could help him, but I don't think it's full. I don't think it's ready. I don't think it's all there. It's only half a solution. It's, so, so you don't tell. You hold it in. He suffers. You failed as the problem solver for all humanity. You didn't use your gifts. You didn't do the reflection. You didn't be, were open with it. So what would happen if you were open? You went across the street and said, listen, bud, I see you struggling with this. And I see you struggling so much. And I think I have part of a solution. It's not the whole solution. And if I get more, I'll come back and tell you next week or whenever about more. But right now, this will get your leg up. It will get you going in a good way. You tell him. And all of a sudden, he goes, Constantine, this is so incredible. This is so amazing. I struggle with this. And your concept, it all works except for the one missing piece. Guess what I got? I struggled and I found that part, but I'm not good at it. I didn't know how to use it. And it goes right in your solution. So you magnetize the extra information you need to, fa to finally do your job. So what happens when you don't honor the red flags and do something in openness? And how would you do it? Right? You get red flags that say, Joe's going to betray me. And you get the red flags. It's not certain, but boy, it's going in that direction. And so... I'm going to tell you that you get your data way in advance. What good would it be if spirit didn't make you aware of things in time that you could do something about it? So you get your data way in advance. If you do your reflection, you get your red flags, you have the ideas of what's going to happen, and you can figure out what to do about it. So here you use openness. Openness is what? My friend. So you use openness and you go to Joe and say, Joe, listen, buddy. I mean, we've been friends for a long time and I value our friendship. I really do. And something's been nagging me, bugging me. I, the things that I've come across and it's just driving me crazy. And I, I want to ask for your help. I think you're the only person that could help me figure it out. And Joe says, well, sure. But, you know, we're friends. What is it? And you roll out your red flags that show that Joe is going to betray you. He might get a little perturbed. How could you even think I would do that to you, Constantine? How do you think that would be? I couldn't do I'm your friend. Why would you think that? Well, I'm so glad to hear. Give me a hug, bud. I mean, I'm so glad from your words. I'm good. I'm comfortable. When was the last time you saw a bank robbery pulled after the Toronto Star published the plan? I don't know. People don't do the deed if it's already out in the open, caught before they do it. The idea wasn't you never go and accuse. You go and show the information and they get to rebut and you don't accuse. 
you know, and so it's just knowledge. And thank you so much for making me calm, making me, I needed to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you used the wisdom, the knowledge, the openness to stop a betrayal that was coming. Why was it coming? Perhaps he had a code that has a chance with integrity and it's his lot in life to experience the dark side of integrity. So he gets temptation. Spirit gives him temptation. Temptation says, I could get a thousand bucks, but I'd have to screw over my buddy Constantine. I don't want to do that. That's a thousand bucks. I'm going to talk myself into it. I'm going to take Constantine out drinking. I'll share the, the spoils with him, right? Because he won't know, right? No, not true. It's your challenge. It's his challenge. It has to come out. There's no getting away with it, right? So he's going he's gonna to screw you over in betrayal unless you've already talked to him about it. And all of a sudden you're going, that's amazing. How did he know? He's a mystic. How did he figure this out? So I got to go tell Constantine that this really did happen. I would never have believed it, but there's the temptation. And I got to tell him, look, this is real. And on the way to meet you, he goes through several of your mutual friends saying, look, look, Constantine's bloody amazing. He's such a mystical mind. He knows things before they happen. This, he, he figures things out. He, you know, if you figure you've got problems, ask him. Your equity is going up as the problem solver in the public eye. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you saw a business card that said philosopher on it? You know, so there's philosophers in every company that problem solve for, every, you know, but the bottom line is that they got to build their equity as a, a go-to person. And this is how you build your equity by solving your own interpersonal problems. What good are you as a problem solver for all humanity if you won't use your gifts to solve your own problems? That rings so close to home. Wow. This is the boot camp of how to master your gifts. And this is what trust is about. It's not about always being trusting, it's about always being vigilant. It's definitely don't be paranoid because this is a worry code. It can go paranoid. You don't want to go there, but you want to use your information, use your gifts to be diligent, to be vigilant, to see things before they happen so you have a chance to set them right before they come to bad. Wow. Okay, I'll have to digest that quite a bit, but it resonates. It makes sense. A lot of those examples hit close to home. Yes. <laughs> Everything you talk about. And I'm going to tell you something. The same code has a challenge with faith. Faith, faith in oneself or faith in everything? Absolutely. Faith in everything. You know, there's people who have blind faith, right? And especially people who don't have reflection. You see all the details. You see everything and all in its and bits. You, you see the pros and the cons. And when you see all the pros and cons, if there's even... If there's even two or three cons, how can you have faith in it? Whatever it is, right? You see all the details in glory and how is it, you, you would scoff at the idea of having faith in something so diligently, but you're not allowed to have faith. Did you know that? We with reflection codes are not allowed to have faith because we have the data. It's our job to decree where people can put their faith. We okay. figure it out. We got nine pros and four cons, and we go to their friends and say, listen, we can have faith in this product. We can have faith in this idea, this concept, this, this, this ideal, this company. We can have faith in this because it's weighted positively. There's only four cons. Nothing's perfect in this dimension. Perfection cannot exist in this dimension. Karmic DNA proves perfection doesn't exist in this dimension. Because the souls don't come here all balanced. They come here as wobbly wheels. You've only got six archetypes and they're all different values. And you're different from everybody else. So it's like, it's an imperfect world because we're having this journey to confront negativity. It's all setting it up so that we have the issues to do what we have to do to save heaven. So interestingly enough, you're not allowed to have faith. You get all the details. You get to worry. You, only you can stop the worry by saying, you know what, I've analyzed it. It's weighted to the positive. Nothing's perfect. So we'll go with it for now. If it changes, I'll let you all know. I decree this is faith worthy. Yeah. Some people listen could resonate with that because yep. they have it. Others would be like, I have no idea what he's talking about because they don't have it. Yeah. They, they would understand it. They'd follow along. They see you're nodding and going, yeah, that's it. That's, you know, they, they get the corroboration, but they don't know it in their own life. And they're going, well, it, it must work because he was on it. You know, he believed it. But it's like I told you, the guy I told the code that he didn't have, he went, you know, you're right. I don't have that one. 
you know, <laughs> that's not me. So this is custom and it's very specific and it's the foundation of knowledge that you can actually put to work today, tomorrow. Everything I told you about reflection is going to change the way you see these things because up till now, I'm certain that they would have been a nemesis. Like, oh my God, is this happening again? Well, certainly it's going to happen over and over. It's your job to figure it out and stop it. And every time you stop it, you get abundance. Every time you master one of the challenges in your karmic DNA, you get growth and abundance. So it is fascinating. It is a, a, a very huge body of evidence that changes every human person's life who learns it. So let me ask you this then. In your world today now, you work with people, you teach the course, you have other practitioners learning to do what you do, or at least some of what you do, right? If people want to work with you or anyone else, where would they find more information? Well, like, yeah, a- they can get their sampler at karmicdna.com. They would have to email me, richard at bioengtherapy.com. And we'll put those in the show notes too, of course, as well. Yeah, I there there is a web page that shows the course. There, there's a brochure. And, and the brochure is, is, is the course curriculum. Whoops. Quite extensive. Like you said, 44 weeks, right? If yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah, 44, 44 sessions. Because, you know, mm. you could do it one a week, the crash course. But, uh, you know, you probably want to space it out a little bit. Maybe one every other week or a couple of weeks in a row, two or three weeks in a row, and then digest. And there's some weeks that are, they're not something you have to like memorize. The, the cool part about our mind, because our mind is not in our brain, it's in our aura. It's as big as a house. And so the cool part about our mind is when you hear something, even if you don't consciously remember it, you have it. Yes. I can definitely agree with that. Yeah. So many things in my life like that. So so all the videos that are in the course, you could sit and watch and become a practitioner in no time. And you could double it up if, if you had nothing else to do. Like if you're sitting around in COVID, you, you could literally, you know, watch videos every day and, and, you know, basically do the exam at the end and be a practitioner. And uh, so, I mean, it's amazing. It's full. It's rich. No stone unturned. Uh, everything from an examination of uh, spirituality and rich and religion, uh, not dissing religion, but looking at, at the juxtaposition of it. And it's what it is. The early part of the course, I think it's the second or third session is about religion versus spirituality. And what it is teaching such a rich foundation that you don't have that either or anymore. It's not a controversy whether you're this or you're that or you're that religion or this spirituality. You're growing your openness to treat each and every person regardless of where the religious background is because the fundamentals we work with are common to all religions. You know, the, the phenomenal thing, and I don't know why it's more widely said, but, you know, they talk about Islam and, the you know, Islam has the Quran and yes. Christianity has the Bible. And Judaism has a Bible because the the Old Testament is a Torah, right? So did you know that in the Quran, they have all the same stories as in the Bible? They have all the same figures. So it's like, why are we fighting? Isn't this the greatest sin of humanity to fight over whose ancestor interpreted spirit properly or interpreted it the same because there's different languages? Sometimes there's words in this language aren't in that language. Obviously, the interpretations are going to be different. But generally, they have all the same stories. So it's like, why are we fighting? And this is something that is examined early on in the course because I needed to teach people how to counsel from purity, from non-judgment. I mean, we all have bias. We all have beliefs. We all have, you know, and I need to teach such a broad understanding that, that you don't have to have a bias anymore. I have healed Sikhs. I have healed Hindus. I healed Jews. Everybody. At one time or another, they've all been in my office. And one had a, a, a turban with a head problem, and they're not supposed to take it off. He took it off in my ov- office because we were dealing with that. Okay? So, I mean, this is a sacred thing. So I was privileged to be witness to that. It's because I come with no judgment. I come with a general understanding of the entire spiritual community. It doesn't matter whether you subscribe to this religion or that religion or not at all, and, and you're spiritual. It doesn't matter. Because all of them 
are literally interpretations of the same spirit. Yes. Right? They're channeled religions. They're, they came to humanity and people wrote down what they got in their head like I did, you know. And so there isn't that difference to be had. And so my course, practitioner's course, is such a rich training that it teaches people the reasons and the hows and the whys to, to come in non-judgmental, no blame counsel, right? Most counseling out there, you know, it's all a lot of, of it is blame. You, you take the blame from you and put it on this person. It, oh, it's because of your mother, right? You're just shifting the blame to release the problem. But no, we don't do that. We find the purpose of what you're thinking and solve this, the issue of the purpose, right? Couple counseling. They have two different karmic data. They have no idea why they're at each other's throat, right? And when I teach the wife his karmic DNA, as well as I've done it hers, I teach his, I teach him his, and I teach the wife hers, or teach him hers. And all of a sudden, you see this growing understanding and rapport, where once they locked horns and said, you did that to me on purpose. You said that on purpose. You hurt me. And because we're most of, the, most of the operating on autopilot from our karmic DNA, right? So now that they know why he said that, why he's doing that, now it's a chuckle. He's doing his thing again, right? I know why he's doing that. It's not per personal. Instant rapport. Knowledge is the power to overcome everything. So, you know, it's, it's very powerful in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Amazing stuff, Richard. Thank you for listening so far. The depth of Dr. Richard's Leach knowledge is truly awe-inspiring, right? We've explored the mechanics of healing with purpose and delved into karmic DNA and, of course, teased biosymbiology. But our journey doesn't end here. Join us for the third part as we dive even deeper into reading the purpose of health through the intriguing world of biosymbiology. Get ready to gain insights that might very well reshape how you view your own health and well-being. Thank you so much for joining us on this exploration of personal transformation. Your presence and engagement are at the heart of what we do, and I sincerely appreciate you, your time and thirst for knowledge, inspiration, and empowerment. Please consider showing your support by hitting like, subscribe, leaving a comment, or writing a review. Your engagement not only fuels our mission, but also helps others discover these insights. For more daily guidance on personal transformation across the mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical realms, be sure to visit our website at unleashthyself.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Unleash Thyself Today, TikTok and YouTube at Unleash Thyself, and there we post daily content designed to inspire and empower you on your journey. If you have any specific thoughts, questions, or feedback, I truly value your input. Or if you'd like to have a conversation with me, or work with me, please feel free to email me directly at constantine at unleashthyself.com. I would love to hear from you. Together, we're building a community united in authenticity and purpose. Once again, thank you for being a part of this movement. Until next time, continue to embrace your true self and live a life on purpose, with purpose. See you in the next episode.